All right, thank you so much to Council President Brenda Jones and uh, Councilwoman at Large Janae Ayers, as well as their staff for partnering with us on putting together this event focused on choosing the right location for your business. Um, as Council President explained, the DEGC, we focus on economic growth in our city. Uh, my name is Lily Hamburger and I'm here with my colleague Martha Poter. And we are members of the Small Business Division of the DEGC, so our focus is on helping small business owners and entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs in the city to make your dreams a reality and help you reach your goals. Uh, we see small businesses as such an important part of our thriving neighborhoods. And so uh, that's what we focus on every day and we hope our presentation will be helpful. If you have any questions beyond what we're talking about, we do um, have a table and we are um, grateful that all of our partners could also be here with us tonight. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, as was mentioned, our, our presentation tonight is focused on helping you choose the right location for your business. And there's a lot of considerations that go into that. Um, so it starts with knowing yourself. And that means knowing what your goals are as a business owner, um, knowing what you're looking for, and knowing uh, how a space and a brick and mortar location will help you reach those goals. Some of the things you might want to consider when you're looking for a space are what is it that you're selling? What is the product or service that you're offering to the world? And how is it unique? What makes people want to have their shoes repaired with you versus somebody else? What is it that makes people want to buy their apples from you versus somebody else, et cetera? Um, is your price point low, high, medium? These are all things that you, choices that you make as a business owner that make your business unique, um, that differentiate you from others. Who is your target audience? Uh, you know, a lot of business owners make the mistake of saying, well, I'm gonna target everybody. Everybody's gonna love my soup. Everybody's gonna want it every day and I'm gonna make a million dollars off this soup. There's actually, a certain section of the population of soup eaters that's gonna really like your soup versus somebody else's soup. So knowing who your target audience is, um, and then how you're delivering your product or service. That's what we mean by service model up there. Um, are you a carry out? Are you a dine in? Are you a catering soup business that drives around and delivers soup? These are the types of things that you'll want to um, know about yourself to help you know what type of space is right for you. The second major thing you want to think about in choosing a location is thinking about the type of space that you're looking for. So before you look at specific buildings, you're going to want to think about the size, but specifically within that size, what types of attributes of the space will be necessary. Um, I was speaking with a woman who owns a um, cosmetics manufacturing business and part of her mission is she has um, a lot of employees with disabilities. Now that's a huge thing that she had to know about herself that helped define the type of space she was looking for because she couldn't have a third floor walk up type of thing. Um, so that was an important consideration. Your business may have certain types of back of the house needs or storage needs. You may need manufacturing space, dishwashing, etc. Um, we did throw up there some rules of thumb for restaurants. Restaurants typically want to have about 40% of the space for back of the house and 60% for front of the house. And then as part of your knowing yourself preparation for looking for space, knowing how many tables will support the amount of revenue that you need um, to break even or to make profit, um, will help you define how much front of the house space you need. So these are the types of things we're talking about in terms of knowing yourself and knowing what you're looking for um, before you look at a specific building. These are the things that you're going to want to think about. And the third thing before you look at any actual buildings is knowing what you can afford. And we definitely live in a place where we have buildings of many different qualities and different price points out there. So knowing your budget is gonna be really important going into a conversation with a building owner, a seller, a landlord, um, to know what you can afford. And there's a couple of things we wanted to mention here. So generally, a good rule of thumb to think about is having the cost of your space be no more than 10% of your sales. And that's whether you're purchasing or renting 10% of your projected sales. Um, and then you can look at comparables 
Look at what other listings are around in the area that you're looking for. You can use the website LoopNet to look at comparable sale prices or rent rates. Um, and then definitely consider whether you are at the stage where brick and mortar is appropriate. Have you tested this? Do you know that people actually like your soup or the you know, shoes you're selling or whatever it is that is your business? Have you tested that? And do you know that you could afford what it takes to be in a brick and mortar location, which is a large overhead expense? Uh, and one other thing to mention with pricing is that your rental rate could be coming at you as a price per square foot or a price per month. And those are just different ways of saying the same thing. So if you see it in square feet or price per month, this is a slide that'll show you how it's kind of the same thing with an example. If it's $1,000 per month, it could be $12 a square foot times 1,000 square feet divided by 12 months a year, 1,000 square, 1,000 per month. Or it could be given to you as this place costs $12 a square foot. That would be 12 months a year times 1,000 square feet divided by 1,000 a month. Two different ways of saying the same thing. So you can do the math depending on how it's given to you. Um, and one other thing I just want to mention is the different type of leases to look out for. Um, the gross lease is where the landlord pays for all the real estate expenses. A triple net lease is where you may be responsible for your utilities, your taxes. And these are things that are definitely good to discuss with the person before you sign the lease and also to get legal advice on. As somebody who specializes in baking cakes or uh, detailing cars or whatever it is that you are an expert in, uh, don't be afraid to get the help from an expert, especially when it comes to leases. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Martha um, to talk more about choosing a specific building. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the fun stuff, which is where to go. Um, how many of you all live in the city of Detroit? All right, good. So you're pretty familiar with the neighborhoods, the areas throughout the city. Um, how many of you know where you wanna go? All right, a few, but looks like a lot of you are still on the fence, so that's good. Um, so a great place to start is actually with a retail study that we published, the DGC, um, last year, which shows what people in 10 neighborhoods throughout the city of Detroit spend their money on currently. Um, most of that money, as you probably can guess, is being spent outside of the city of Detroit, but it's being spent nonetheless. And so the retail study took a look at what retail commodities people are purchasing. And the number one thing that most neighborhoods need is, anybody got any guesses? Parking. Parking is, yes, that's correct. Money, it's, it's groceries actually. Um, so we're not actually a food desert, we do have grocery stores, but a lot of Detroiters choose to do their grocery shopping elsewhere because um, from what we heard, they think the product offerings and quality tends to be better in stores outside the city. I don't know if you agree with that or not, it's just what we heard. Um, but the retail study um, gives you four really great um, pieces of information. It gives you retail fundamentals, so how um, you should, if you are aspiring to be a retailer, um, potentially run your business. It talks about the demographic profiles of these neighborhoods that I've mentioned. And it, like I said, it talks about the retail demand in those places and then recommendations for how to make that retail happen. Um, a really great tool that came out of this retail study is called the Unmet Demand Generator. So this will tell you um, for each neighborhood where the most unmet demand is. I mentioned that most neighborhoods need grocery stores. Um, that's a commonality, but every neighborhood is different. Um, some neighborhoods need more pharmacies than others or more dry cleaners. Some neighborhoods have too much um, general merchandising, too many furniture stores, t-shirt stores, that kinds of thing. Um, so this is a really interesting tool to help you understand based on the type of business you're looking to open, where the most demand exists for your good or, or service. So I wanna talk a little bit about consumer behavior. Um, this is something also to keep in mind. So the smallest circle of what I'll call willingness to travel is for everyday items like coffee, 
when you wake up and you're out of coffee, you're not really willing to drive to like East Point. Um, at least I'm not. And what we know about customer psychology is that not most people are. They want to be able to go somewhere like two blocks away and pick up that coffee that they need. When you talk about um, like where you want to go out for dinner, your willingness to travel, that diameter gets a little bigger. You know, you don't go out to eat probably every day. Um, so you're willing to go a little farther for that special meal. And then when you talk about something like an engagement ring, for example, that's going to be the farthest distance that our consumers are willing to travel because it's a big purchase and it's one that you might only make once in your life. So if you've got to drive out to the suburbs or maybe even in Canada, um, you know, that, that type of purchase would um, warrant a farther travel time. So think about that. What are your, what is your business offering? Is it an everyday good or service? Then you might want to make sure you're located really close to the people that you're trying to serve. If you're something special, we call that a destination business, and you might um, not need to be necessarily right in the neighborhood where you expect most of your customers to be coming from. Um, so best practices, again, when thinking about a location, um, the retail study is great, but we also want you, it's not the only thing that should determine where um, you're willing to locate. Um, you're going to want to think about your price point. Does that match the population that you're looking to serve? Um, and then, as Lily mentioned, what are you offering that differentiates you? What makes that soup special? Um, that helps you uh, accomplish step two up here, which is defining the gap in the market. Um, you know, where do you fit in? If everybody's opening t-shirt shops, what makes your t-shirt shop different? And is that really a good idea to try and go into a market with a lot of t-shirt shops? Maybe you should look somewhere else. Um, and then again, match your target audience to your neighborhood demographics. Once you figure out exactly who your customer is, figure out where a lot of those kinds of people live, and that'll help you figure out where you want to go. Now let's talk about neighborhoods specific to Detroit. I put this map up on the wall today because this is where the city of Detroit is currently um, investing some pretty substantial amounts of money. Planning studies, streetscape improvements, um, major catalytic park improvements, they tend to be happening in these um, strategic neighborhoods. So I want you to be aware of this if you're not already, because although um, it may seem like a streetscape, for example, is extremely disruptive, and no argument from me there, um, it is also a street on which you're gonna have all sorts of new amenities. And another thing that we know is that when um, the private market sees public investment, they tend to also want to invest there. So these neighborhoods, because they're receiving a little extra love right now from the city of Detroit in terms of dollars and infrastructure, um, they tend to be places where um, more people, you know, might end up investing and you might have more foot traffic. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about this slide, and I'm so sorry, it's, it's really small, um, but I want you to know that all this information is on our website. This is a demographic snapshot. And I, it's for East Warren. I just saw that at the bottom of the screen. So this is telling you everything about this particular community that you may want to know. It tells you how many people live there, how many employees come to that community every day to work, what the median household income is, um, their primary ethnicity, I believe, education level, age, um, and then this retail opportunity in this shaded box here talks about what this neighborhood buys and how many millions, most of the time, dollars they're spending every year on specific categories of retail, food at home, aka grocery. Um, looks like alcohol away from home, that would be a bar. Um, and then also we've got, I can't even read this, I'm so sorry, apparel, for example. So these are really handy, again, when you're starting to think about where exactly in the city you want to locate. We also want you to be cognizant of the, the actual physical things that contribute to healthy, vibrant retail environments. They are double-sided blocks. 
So if you, for example, um, are across the street from a major manufacturing plant that takes up, you know, a quarter of a mile of the street across from you, that's maybe not as ideal as if you have retail uh, individual stores on the, on the other side of the street facing your location. Um, highly visible, you want it concentrated so that when somebody uh, travels to a retail corridor and they pop out to maybe grab food from, from someplace, they're close enough to your store where they might peek in and say, hey, what's going on here? And then make, um, you know, make it into your store and see what you're offering. Accessible, so you don't really want to be in a place where it's hard to figure out where the entrance is or where the parking is. Um, and customer adjacent. So that means you're located in a place where you've got a pretty good density of people living near you. Um, if you're interested in where you can find available properties, here are some, some ways you can figure that out. Of course, real estate brokers are always a good source. Um, community organizations as well. If you're looking in neighborhoods where there's an active community organization like Eastside Community Network, like Jefferson East Inc., like Grand Mont Rosedale Development Corporation, these organizations can often help you identify buildings. Maybe they don't have a big for sale sign out front, but they're vacant. These organizations know the owner. They could put you in touch with them. We here at the DGC are always, help, are always willing to help as well with real estate. Um, and then LoopNet, it's a pay for um, service software, but it can help you identify available commercial buildings. We also want to just make sure you're aware of the potential pitfalls when trying to find a location. Um, so your lease is a big one. Um, make sure that you're very familiar with what's in your lease. We highly recommend having an attorney look, look it over. Um, you want to be very clear on what the terms are, as Lily mentioned, is it gross, is it triple net, um, and then conditions of delivery. What can you expect to see the first day you unlock the door and walk in to start moving in your business? Is it gonna have walls? Is it gonna have working electrical? Make sure you know exactly what the landlord is promising to deliver to you with that property. And on that note, do your due diligence. Um, you're going to want to make sure that the environmental is, and, and what that means is that there hasn't been any um, dangerous uh, conditions that the parcel itself has experienced. Um, the building conditions too. I mean, beyond making sure it has a roof. How old is the electrical? Has it been updated or does it pose any risks of, you know, that circuit board catching on fire someday and, and burning down your business? Um, your MEP systems, those are mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. Make sure you understand what, what condition they're in. And financing. It never hurts to start speaking with a traditional financial institution like a bank or a community development financial institution. Get that ball rolling as soon as possible so that when you're ready to take that leap, you have the loan or the financing that you need to take it. Oh, and I should have mentioned, I'm sorry. Um, regarding due diligence, I also wanted to um, mention that we ha now have a step-by-step -step guide for everything that a new business could possibly encounter in terms of licensing and permitting from the city and other relevant departments, um, from signing the lease or purchasing a building to opening. Those guides are available on our resource table in the back, so please help yourselves. Um, and again, if you have any questions, you don't have to have them um, asked tonight. We're always here to field questions about that. Um, so to wrap up your dream team, this is who is going to help you get your business open. You're going to have a broker, a landlord, and a tenant rep. Those are different things, so make sure that you understand the difference. Um, your property owner is probably going to be a pretty big player in this whole thing. Business support organizations like all of those around the room tonight and your community organizations. So that wraps it up for us. Lily, Martha, we'll be at the table in the back if you have any additional questions. Thank you for your patience and for listening. Really appreciate your time. Um, so I'd like to invite up our colleague, Denise Colonna. Um, she's going to talk a little bit about um, our program's Motor City Match and Restore, and then we'll have a few more introductions before we break for the networking. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And it is an honor to stand here before you and thank you very much, both of you. So I'm here to talk briefly about Motor City Match and Motor City Restore. Motor City Restore is a program that will help you, the entrepreneur that's already in operations, for at least two years, okay? Now, uh, and even if you're the building owner, as long as you have a, a business in your building, we can work with you. Now, the information I'm gonna provide with you, you can always call the 800 number for Motor City Restore, okay? Now, you, again, you have to be in business for two years. We will help fix the infrastructure of your building, meaning uh, a new awning, windows, doors, landscape, your parking lot, and uh, we want to make the community, the commercial buildings, look lively. We don't want a dull building with the lights hanging off or anything. We want to bring it to life, and we want to help you bring your business back to life, all right? So uh, you can call, again, the 800 number. Again, the ladies here will also help you with more information about that. Now let me say this, uh, if you are one business and there are two or three others within a fourth of a mile in your business, then we can help you by you know, fixing up your building and it will not be so expensive. I will not get into the details of the financing because it all depends if it's just one business or if it's four. But again, if you call the 800 number for Motor City Restore, we will help you. The program manager is Gregoire Eugene Lewis and myself. But if you call that number, we're going to work with you. Okay? You got me? All right, all right. Now we're going to talk about Motor City Restore. I mean, Motor City Match, forgive me, please. This program I love because I loved for people to call to who have an idea, but you don't know how to get started. And I'm one who will sit down and listen to you when you call that 800 number for Motor City uh, Match, okay? So if you have an idea and you wanna open up a business, there are four tracks out there for you to apply for. The very first one is a business plan. You need a business plan Secondly, you're gonna need a space, which is what the young ladies talked about this afternoon. Thirdly, you might need an architectural design for your business. It's all contingent of what your business is going to be. And lastly is the cash. Now, you can only apply for one track per quarter, and it's every 90 days. Now, currently, we are in round 17. Round 17 ends on November the 1st at 11.59 p.m you have to apply online through this program, as well as with Motor City Restore, let me say that. Motor City Match, though, is a very good program, and I want you to really, if you're really, truly seeking a business, don't wait until you know the round close and say, I wish I could have. But I want you to call tomorrow, and I'm gonna be waiting for your call so we can help you and get things going. We have a wonderful staff that will help you. And each track that I just mentioned, we have a track manager to meet your needs. All right? All right. And then lastly, through this program, we have something that is called the BizGrid that will also help you. And there, are, there is a variety of information that will help you from funding, uh, uh, the, force, the workforce, the research and development, it's a wealth of information, like a directory, that we have created here through uh, DEGC. And so please, uh, do not leave here until we talk with staff or call the 800 number. And we're going to be waiting, and you only have until November the 1st to put in your application online, okay, by 11.59 p.m. on November the 1st. Thank you.